I am just uh, introducing the second part of this talk. Uh, this talk, I think that, uh, well, in, uh, in, uh, at the middle of this talk, I will also uh, have the pleasure to uh, introduce also a colleague of us, a colleague of our Alofis group, uh, the name is uh, Leo Cho, that uh, helped us uh, a lot, a lot to uh, improve the algorithm in, uh, in, uh, that, that, that was able to, to to create a new experiment that I will show in a bit. And so it is just a way to say that from now on, I will conclude the description of what I said at the, at the first part of uh, the lecture of, uh, of the morning. I will introduce a new, a new algorithm. It is maybe more, in a, that is, uh, let me say, uh, quantum inspired in a more general way. And in this case, that will be very important to show also how it is developed in a, in a, in a, in a computer language. And for this, in, in, uh, at the middle of this lecture, I will um, ask for, uh, for Leo Cho to, to have some minutes to uh, show the package he wrote and create uh, 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 in order to, to run this, the, the, the code I will introduce. But, well, let me start again from the point I stopped today. Uh, well, I showed how that was possible to provide a kind of uh, uh, quantum inspired quantum version quantum version of the nearest mean classifier that was based on the fact that uh, uh, the the idea of quantum centroid uh, is completely different to the idea of uh, uh, of the classical centroid and mostly it is not a quantum translation of the classical centroid, but it's something that, is, uh, uh, that has meaning, that assumes his meaning only in the context of quantum uh, framework. So uh, that is very important. For instance, for instance, and other things that makes the quantum centroid completely different with respect to the classical one is the fact that it is not invariant under rescaling. What I mean is this, if uh, we consider, again, I use, uh, I use the, um, my desk. Um, if we consider a set of data like this, and we consider to make a kind of uh, translation or some similar transformation, not only translation, okay? To this data in, uh, for a constant, for instance, something like dear, or just expand the, fig the figure, uh, something, like the, uh, uh, something like this. W what we can say is that also the centroid will be translated. So, in this sense, we can say that from a classical perspective, the, this system and this system are totally equivalent, in the sense that by making a rescaling, uh, let me say that, um, uh, also the centroid will be the initial centroid transformed by this rescaling. So we say that this transform the, the centroid is invariant under this transformation. This is what does not happen with the quantum centroid. The quantum centroid is not invariant under rescaling. So by making a rescaling of each features of each object of the data set, what we obtain will be not the centroid obtained by rescaling the initial centroid. But we obtain a totally new object, a totally new object. I know that it can uh, uh, seem like a counterintuitive. It is, it is basically. But from an embarrassment, it can be an asset. Uh, indeed, uh, we can consider the rescaling as a part of the pre-processing of the classification. Uh, I mean that uh, we can we can try to make an ad hoc preprocessing of the data in the training part of our classification in order to have a further improvement of the accuracy of the classification. So what we will do is just to make a to um, select. A, uh, a rescaling factor k in such a way that this rescaling factor can improve the accuracy of the classification. 
This is impossible in the classical context, just because, indeed, the classical context is invariant under this scale. But this is a plot uh, that we have thanks to uh, Martin Bozic that uh, collaborated with us in the first part of this project. We can see, for instance, this is the accuracy, the accuracy we have uh, without any rescaling, and this is the accuracy we have just by rescaling each uh, uh, feature of each uh, object of the data set. And we can see that uh, for some rescaling, the accuracy decreases, but for some other increasing, uh, for some other uh, uh, um, um, rescaling factor, sorry, the accuracy can increase, can also increase, as we can see here, as we can see here, and so on. So, till now, we have individuated two things uh, that can be um, arranged in our favor in order to provide a better classification. These two things are, first of all, the encoding we use, because we can use different encodings. Second, we can also change the rescaling factor. So, by making an optimization, optimization over rescaling, and uh, um, encoding, we can obtain a further, a further increasing in the value of the accuracy of our performance or our or our algorithm. This is not uh, particularly new as a strategy because in uh, any in uh, any uh, classification protocol, general also classical one, okay, general. Uh, uh, people, <clears throat> is usual to individuate parameters. These parameters that will optimize it during the, during the, the, um, the, 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 the training, the training of the classifier in order to gain further, further uh, uh, increasing of the accuracy. Okay, so <clears throat> by considering also this, we tried to uh, have a step further. We try to uh, apply this, uh, our algorithm to a real important data set, a real data set, and compare this not only with uh, uh, the, uh, the nearest mean classifier, but also with other more performant classifier, like the linear discriminant analysis and the quadratic discriminant analysis. The, algo the um, data set we considered, we considered was an algorithm related to patients whose diagnosis was affected or not affected by uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that is uh, a disease, uh, important disease, and the features that we consider for the patient uh, could be the feature that, could, that you can imagine, for something like the uh, the, um, the um, uh, age, for instance, of the patient, of the, uh, let me say, degree of health of the patient, or something like, like this that was, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> that, was, uh, that was quantified by, with um, a group of researchers that was work, that is working on um, biological imaging. And, um, we consider a group of 126 patients and uh, uh, um, uh, the data we obtained over the accuracy are this one. So we consider here the quantum, uh, uh, um, the quantum version of the nearest mean classifier with different rescaling factors, with different rescaling factors in a range, in a certain range. And we compare this with not only the nearest mean centroid classifier, but also with other classifiers. And we have seen that we reached a good, a good result also by affording the possibility to uh, have different, different rescaling, different rescaling. Okay, <coughs> sorry. Okay, well, till now the point is that we have considered, we was considering in a certain sense quantum inspired machine learning, but, <clears throat> and uh, as I said in the first part of, of, of the talk, we like to appeal uh, to this method just as quantum learning. There is no reason to only speak about inspired. Most of all now, because 
uh, in the first algorithm I described, that I uh, considered a new definition of quantum centroid. Well, but I was strictly inspired by the nearest mean classifier. What I will provide now it will be a new classifier that basically is inspired by quantum theory, but does not refer to any classical classifier. So it is not, uh, it, it will be no more a quantum version or a quantum translation of something that are already exists in the classical context. So there will be something typical and 100% quantum, okay? So what is the structure of this? So the basis of this is the quantum, the quantum state of discrimination whose uh, general setting are, are given by this let we can consider a set of quantum state with a, res a respective a priori probability given for such a reason we are not uh, we are not interested on, on, on this and uh, Alice had to select a quantum state rho i from this set with a priori probability pi Alice sent the physical system in the state rho i to Bob and Bob has with some strategy, optimal find the value of the index i by performing a measure on the physical system sent by Alice. So, Bob can receive rho, can measure rho, and in base of this measure, Bob has to uh, uh, guess with, uh, in, a, in an optimal way what is the label, in a certain sense, the label i, uh, that at the beginning um, Alice attributed to the set row. So in a certain sense, uh, well, I am describing in a very naive way the, quant the, the problem of quantum state discrimination. It is obviously more and more complex. It is a, a particular uh, part of, uh, <coughs> of, quantum, of the quantum information theory. But generally we can naturally see an analogy, an analogy with the classification problem. Because in a certain sense, the index i can be seen as a sort of label, and the problem of the discrimination can be seen as a sort of classification. So we can take inspiration from quantum state discrimination in order to provide a new setting of a of a, a, a quantum quantum uh, inspired uh, uh, classifier or just quantum learning. So, following the standard quantum information theory, this is a, a one of the um, construction that was uh, uh, um, introduced by Elstrom some uh, decades ago. Uh, following st st standard quantum information theory, let rho one and rho k density operators and let associate for each rho a and a, and a priori probability. So we can define a state as a pair rho p. It is very similar to the definition we gave to the pattern, where the pattern is given by a vector and a label. It's very, in a certain sense, is, is similar, but now we have an a priori probability. Okay, where rho is a density operator, and p is uh, its respective a priori probability, and it does define a set of states as a set of pairs, given in this way. Convex in, 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 in the probability, in the sense that the sum of the probability has to be, uh, has to sum to one. Let us consider a set of uh, two states. So now let us confine in the only binary case. So row one and row two. Um, it is possible to introduce what we say uh, Elstrom observable, like this big lambda. This big lambda is given by P1 rho 1 minus P2 rho 2. Okay. Now, we consider as lambda plus the set of all eigenvectors of lambda associated to positive eigenvalues. So we calculate the eigenvalues of uh, this, uh, one, uh, this Elstrom observable, big lambda. And we will have some positive and some negative eigenvalues. Okay, oh sorry. Okay, and so there are lambda, lambda plus the set of all the eigenvectors 
associated to all the positive eigenvalues of the Elstrom observable lambda. Similarly, we will do with uh, lambda minus, lambda minus. On this basis, uh, we can construct P plus and P minus by making the projector over all the vector in lambda minus and take the sum of this. And the same we do with P minus. And what we will see is that P minus and P plus uh, forms, form a von Neumann measurement. That are, that are in the sense that P plus plus P minus is equal to the identity. And from a logical perspective, it can allow us to uh, interpret this P plus and P minus as an object that allow us to, uh, how can I say, introduce a definition of probability. Probability in the same sense that uh, we obtain with P0 and P uh, in the same meaning of the probability of truth and false that was introduced in the Giuntini's talk when he was speaking about the uh, probability in quantum computational logic. So the probability of a sentence to be true or to be false. So, because again, P plus and P minus are a von Neumann measurement. So, so uh, this lemma that is, uh, that is uh, uh, proved by, 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 uh, by Elstrom is not our, our, uh, our result. It's just a, a lemma that uh, gives us the probability to make a correct distinguish between row one and row two. So, to make a good, a good uh, discrimination in the sense of quantum state discrimination. Okay, the probability to make a good discrimination is given by P1, this a priori probability, uh, multiplied by the trace of P plus row one plus P2, trace that P minus row two. So, Piguez is generally called Elstrom bound in a certain sense of the error in the discrimination between the two density operator or one error two. So the point is the uh, so the point is how hard how hard is to discriminate the state row one, the physical state row one error two by making a given measurement. This difficulty to the, uh, to make this uh, discrimination is quantified by this PGS, by this PGS. It is given by this quantity, and this quantity is described by the, uh, by the, the, the steps I, I uh, defined in, the, in these three slides before. Okay, as you can see, as you can see, this definition, this framework, is uh, very nice for us to apply in the, moving the problem to quantum state discrimination in the framework, to the framework of classification. It is just what we tried to do, just what we tried to do. So, we considered binary classification. So, we consider a, a, a set of objects as one XM that belongs to the training data set, and we consider that they have only two classes plus and minus, the class plus and the class minus, like the class of cats and the class of dogs. We extract only the training data set that we call STR. And OK, so we have the subset S plus TR and S minus TR. So this is the set, the training set of the cats. This is the training set of the dogs, for instance. OK. Given this, we make the encoding. So we translate each classical object that is here in terms of a quantum pattern. A quantum pattern. So now we have two objects. We have, we have sorry, two set of quantum objects. So we are going in a, simu, in a situation that is similar to the quantum straight state discrimination that we described above. After we calculate the quantum centroid for the first class and the quantum centroid for the second class in the way we have already defined before. Okay, now the point is 
easier is to make a distinguish between the two centroid, better will be the classification. So this is the K point of the method. So if now we apply the quantum state discrimination between rho plus and rho minus, we can say that if we are, and, and it is reasonable because we say, if we are in a good situation that allow us to make a very clear distinction, distinction between the two centroid, it's more probable that we will make a good classification because distinguish between centroid means classify in a good way, in a better way. So now our problem is just given a object rho are able to distinguish if rho is more probable that it is rho plus or rho minus. So in this way, we can replace exactly the same we did, we described before uh, for Elstrom, but in our framework. So again, we consider this Elstrom observable where rho plus and rho minus are our centroid. And the a priori probability are given by the cardinality of the wall set M. And over we have the cardinality of the positive object, in the sense the cats and the dog. So, and this is an a priori probability because in a certain sense, if we have more dogs, it is, a priori more probable that you will pick a dog with respect to the cat. And so now we exactly have the same framework that we considered before. So we considered the positive and negative eigenvalue. And now I have to apologize because, uh, because the notation now is not very clear because, uh, well, sorry for this, but in this, uh, uh, in this right, the, the plus and plus means the class, the class plus and the class minus. But here, the lambda plus means the positive eigenvalues. So very sorry for this. Uh, and, uh, and But uh, basically, there is no way to make a confusion because when we refer to the eigenvalues, th this is only the sign that, that there are no other chance that uh, only can be the sign of the eigenvalue. But, and, but when we refer to the class, that means class of object uh, plus and class of object minus. So it is a little bit scrambled, but anyway, there is no way to, to make uh, uh, totally confusion about this. Okay, so we replace everything. And at the end, given an, 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 an object rho x that we don't know if, uh, that we want to classify, we say that this rho x belongs to the class plus if the trace of rho x times p plus, where this p plus is the projector that we have defined um, in virtue of the Hellstrom observable, if this, that means a probability, because remind that this p is a von Neumann measurement, so it can be considered as a probability, so if this is greater than this, we, associate, we classify rho x in the class plus. Otherwise, we classify this in the class minus. This is our Elstrom classifier that, as you can see again, it is inspired by, classic, by quantum information in the sense that we can perform it without using quantum gates but just using a, an algorithm, an algorithm that can be written in a, in a, in a, in a classical language, in a classical uh, uh, computational language, but by referring to the Elstrom quantum information. So it is a prototypical example of quantum information, uh, sorry, of quantum inspired algorithm. And unlike the previous case, it is not a, remake of a classical thing, but it is a completely quantum inspired, a completely quantum inspired. Okay, everything here can be interesting till a certain point, because if the, exp oh, okay, sorry, sorry, before there is another, another thing that is, uh, that is very important. Okay, 
Once we, cons okay, uh, you remember that when we introduced the quantum centroid, that was not only because uh, we like to use quantum formalism, but also because the quantum formalism allow allows us to afford some property that we can use for our, uh, for our aims. We do the same now. We do the same now because the fact that we make an encoding from classical to quantum allows us to use another benefit of the quantum theory. The benefit that is in the quantum theory and that does not hold in the classical theory is that making a copy of the same state provides in quantum theory additional information, increase the amount of information of a given system. What I mean is that if I make a tensor product of rho for it by itself, the state that, that we obtain from, for, from an entropic point of view is not equivalent to the initial state rho. It's not equivalent. Unlike the classical case, because in classical case, if we make copy of the same state, we don't have any different from an entropic, from an informational point of view. On the other hand, in, uh, in quantum information, in, uh, in, uh, and, and now I will explain in which sense it is useful for us, but making a copy of a given state. Uh, Giuseppe, uh, there is a question for you on the chat. Uh, from uh, Clarissa Lee. Clarissa, please. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Hi. Um, sorry if you might have. Um, sorry if you have actually addressed this. Uh, I was just uh, referring to the uh, Hellstrom bound uh, that you were showing earlier, the specific equation where you have the P guess. So yes. I was just, and because you were talking about in relation to errors, so I was just wondering whether it's meant to refine, you know, for the quantum classifier yes. uh, process is to refine your ability to guess between the target data and potential errors seen that you're picking them randomly. So you might, you know, uh, sometimes, how does it mess, uh, mix up uh, errors from the data that you, that is the actual target within the probabilistic density. I'm just trying to see if that's what is meant by that equation. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know if I correctly understand your question. Your question is uh, if I correctly understand. From the definition of, of why I make this definition of the right? Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's right. That makes sense. This this answer is uh, is uh, this question is uh, is um, yeah. That I was not focusing on this, and it is important. Well, the fact that the PGS is given by this expression is it 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 is in a certain sense. Um. Let me use. Uh, this other definition, okay? Okay, it is related in a certain sense to a probability because, well, we know that the trace of a projector times a density operator means in a general setting a probability. It is just the classical, the classical framework of probability. So in a certain sense, it is the probability to make the, the correct discrimination is given by the combination, let me say that, of the probability to uh, uh, pick exactly the row one if it is in the class in the class plus, or to uh, correctly pick the row two if it is in the class minus. In this sense, these two parts, these two addendum of the these two factor of the PGS are exactly what do we want to exploit in, uh, sorry, sorry, in, uh, in this expression of Elstrom classifier? Again, given the fact that these two factors are just the probability, 
we interpret this in this way. If, well, given a rho x, given the fact that this is a project that is, from a logical point of view, it is just the property to be in the space P plus, where we remind that the P plus is given by the sum of all the projector of the positive. Let me say that. So, given by this, uh, given by this, we can say that this is, in a certain sense, uh, the probability that rho x belongs to this class. On the other end, this is the probability that rho x belongs on the other class. And we say, well, we classify in this uh, logical sense. So, if this probability that is uh, uh, exactly given in terms of Bohr probability, yeah, because it is uh, just uh, given by the Bohr definition of probability, it is of course not Kolmogorovian. If this probability is greater than this, uh, we classify it as a plus. Is class we classify it, it as a plus. Given the fact that this plus and this plus has not the same meaning, eh? we know this, we, I stress at this point. But this is a way to classify this, uh, this object rho x. Well, we say again that this object rho x belongs to the class plus if the probability to obtain rho x in this span, let me say it mathematically, this span is greater than obtain this in this in this span. This is the, the idea that is again idea suggested by suggested by this uh, this definition of uh, sorry of uh, pgs of uh, pgs okay i don't know if i can go on well, okay so okay so now what we will do we will do is just to provide a um extension of this uh, of this uh, definition, extension of this definition. Let me say just uh, okay. Um, okay, an extension taking into account the copies. The point related to the copies is very important. So we understand that making the again, we speak about the pre processing. In the pre processing, we decide to make copies of each state. So once we have a data set, we encode each object in terms of density operator, and we make a tensor product of each object by itself, one time, two time, we decide at the beginning. We say three times, for instance, okay, each object of the data set, of all the data set, will be copied three times. That will be a part of the preprocessing, okay? After, we again replace all all of this, we define a new lambda that will be not a tensor product of the, of the initial lambda, okay? Because if we obtain, if we make a tensor uh, copy of each object, the centroid we will obtain will be not the tensor product of the centroid, but we will be a totally new object, a totally new object. So everything changes, everything changes. So we have a totally new classification, a totally new classification. And at the end, we will have, okay, when we have to consider to classify a new object rho x, before we have to copy this object time itself, n times, and at the end we define this extensional definition of Elstrom classifier, that is, that consider also the possibility to make copy of the states. Copy of the states. Okay, okay. So now I'm going to describe the algorithm. The algorithm. Uh, I I want to know how long time I have. So I started. The, uh, okay. Um, when is the, the the end of the talk? Is uh, scheduled. You, so you have you have roughly uh, thirty five minutes. Thirty five minutes from now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can go even a bit longer. You can take 40 okay. minutes without problems. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So, the pre-processing, okay. Okay, 
the preprocessing will be given by different stages. So, given the classical data, we first make a sampling. So, when we have to deal with a big, big data, we, at the beginning, make a sampling of this data. Uh, and this sampling has to be uh, representative. So, there is the first part of the preprocessing. The second part is given by a normalization, so that the value of each feature will be in the interval 0, 1. The second part is the standardization, for instance. So we have mean, v, mean value equal to 0, a standard deviation equal to 1. It is not necessary, but it is the very standard way to make a preprocessing, and it uh, can have important incidence in the classification. So very often make an, um, a structure right a structure right the preprocessing can be can be, be very beneficial for 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 the classification so now uh, i have just defined the how is theoretically justified the elstrom quantum classifier but now i am in detail come and coming in detail in the preprocessing that we also performed just in order to have the uh, final data that, as we will see, will be given in a large scale experiment. Okay, is the preprocessing. And, and after there is the training. The training is given by two important uh, things, two important stages the hypertuning that I will describe now, and, uh, and, the, and the centroid. Because, uh, as we said at the beginning, uh, when we decide to obtain the training, uh, wh when we extract the training set, uh, the first thing we use this uh, is just in order to calculate the centroid, because the first aim of the uh, training uh, stage is just to calculate the centroid, because without the centroid, uh, we cannot define P plus and P minus. So the centroid is crucial in order to define P plus and P minus. Okay, but, I introduce this hypertuning as a part of the training. What, the, what this hypertuning is, how it is, uh, it is uh, dealing with. So, as we seen, as we seen, our uh, our classification uh, depends on three important variables that are the encoding, the rescaling factor. But now, but now, we see that also the copies, the number of the copies can be an element that we can consider. So it is important to also consider the number of the copies. So there are these three parameters that we have to set, that we have to set before making the test, before making the test. So setting these, these parameters is a part of the training, is a part of the training of the process. Or, if we want to say, is part of the pre-processing. It's part of the pre-processing. So, in the, uh, the, the standard way to set these, uh, these, uh, uh, these parameters is just to make the cross-validation. So, the cross-validation is given by using the test set, the, sorry, the training set. We split the training set in five folds, and we pick every time a different. Oh, sorry, I prefer to okay disactivate my WhatsApp, otherwise, there is the risk to uh, uh, listen a beep every time. Okay, we slip with with uh, with the training set in five different folds. One fold is called the validation folds. The other four faults are calling the training faults. So we have a training inside the training. Okay. So for a, okay, any time we use the four faults as a training faults in order to see what is the best set. So the best setting of these three parameters, and we use the validation fold as a test set. We repeat the same experiment five times, any time by uh, swapping 
uh, anytime by picking a different validation fold, a different validation fold. At the end, we have an average value that allow us to choose, to make a choice about what is the best encoding, what is the best rescaling factor, what is the, how many copies better to provide, because generally, generally it's better to make more copies, but sometimes uh, that could be also convenient to use three copies instead of four. This is just a matter of probability, matter of probability. And so, and so, at the end, at, so we have uh, two different uh, um, aims in our, in our uh, um, uh, training. The first is just to find the uh, centroid that allow us to calculate P plus and P minus. Otherwise, I cannot define the, 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 um, the classifier. The second is the hypertuning that allow us to uh, find what are the best value of encoding, the scaling factor and copies that I can use in order to have a good, a good performance of the accuracy, also other, other statistical quantity. Okay, okay. And again, we can have experiment of, uh, over this, just also considering also L Elstrom classifier with different number of copies of the states. For instance, with one, two, three, four, five, six copies. And what we see is that generally, generally, increasing the number of the copy, uh, it, it, there is also an increasing generally also to the performance of the accuracy. Not always, but generally it is. Okay, we have we pro, we make this experiment with the Gaussian data set, with Moon data set, that is the data set that you have already seen before with banana and so on. And again, we always see this trend, this trend that by increasing the number of the copy, we have an increasing of the performance. And this increasing is very, very important because you remember the banana data set. With the, you, we started by the nearest mean classifier where the accuracy was very low. We go with the, our first version of the quantum nearest mean classifier. And we go to the 70. Uh, percent of accuracy. After we introduce the Elstrom, and by making a copy with the Elstrom, we go from 70 to 81, for instance. So we are going better and better and better. Of course, what I want to say is that, the, well, making a copy of, uh, of uh, each object is not free of any price. Because, of course, well, if we have uh, uh, let us consider to have a data set of, uh, of, uh, of a given number of data. Well, if you have a vector V given by, well, that is uh, in Rn, we know that uh, if, we if we encode this in, uh, a, uh, uh, in terms of density, in density pattern, we obtain a row that belongs to D n plus one. So, density operator whose dimension is n plus one. That means n plus one square matrices. If we make the tensor product of this row k times, we have square matrices whose dimension is n plus one times k. This has to be given for each object of data set. So, from a computational point of view, it is quite heavy. So, it can be, it can be, uh, well, again, it, uh, that, that has a, a complex, well, this is just the complexity order of the data set that is, in a certain sense, exponential with the number of the copy. So, we cannot just make num an arbitrary number of the copy without penny, paying any price. So, but anyway, for some kind of computation and for some limited number of the copy, it is, uh, it is reasonable to do, it is, uh, it is possible to do. Okay, so we have the full experiment. As I said several times, the full experiment can be given just making a comparison between, between different data set over 
over different uh, different uh, uh, sorry di comparing different uh, classifiers over different data set and the results are very good well now i cannot go in, uh, come into details for any for any uh, um, uh, um, uh, for any data set but this uh, this picture maybe is nice because in this uh, in this axis uh, you can have the name of the data set and it, in this line you have the different classifier well if the color is close to the blue it means that the classifier is good for this data set if the color is red, is not a good classifier. For each data set, you can see that the Elstrom quantum classifier uh, for each data set is, the, is one of the most blue for each line. So it means that for each, for any, for each, let me say, for each data set, the Elstrom quantum classifier is always one of the best classifiers one of the best classifier. compared this time no one no no more with only two or three classifiers but uh, with many well performing classifiers we have here another nice picture because uh, here we say well if we compare for instance elstrom with uh, I, I don't know for instance bernoulli classifier okay this num this picture this uh, this uh, data at 86 percent means that I compare this Elstrom with Bernoulli over all our 16 data set. How many times over this 16 data set Elstrom was better than Bernoulli? The 86% of times and so on and so on. This is a cross comparison among all the classifiers. And as we can see, the more purple means that more winner and the Elstrom quantum classifier is the more winner one. Okay, let me say this. And so this is an average successful rank. So we can say that the Elstrom with four copy was the best. The Elstrom with three copy was the second. The Gaussian was very good. Again, the Elstrom and the other was was with other ranking and we consider it a very different kind of data set right easier and hard data set so and uh, and this is just a large scale experiment that can allow us can allow us to say well how our classifier can be considered as uh, more than promising because just because it works just because it works okay now we have um, I, I like to come into theoretical details, but I have no times and, uh, and, and, and there is not, I think, very interesting to show a generalization of this result that we obtained, but we already have a, a, a more general result that say that in general, in general, increasing the number of copies increase the probability to have a good classification. Increase the probability. That does not mean that for sure we will have a better performance. But what we can be for sure is that the probability to have a better performance will be greater by increasing the number of the copy of the states that we have. Okay, all, all, all these, uh, these, uh, um, these uh, um, uh, uh, algorithm this algorithm, including the cross validation, all the training, and all the optimization, was, uh, was in a very nice way performed in a very compact uh, package uh, by, by Leo Cho, that is now a, a, a member of our Al Office group. And, um, and that was uh, published in this link, GitHub. And uh, I, I think that uh, Leo is online now. And uh, I can ask uh, him to uh, to just uh, have some uh, some some minutes to to show this uh, this package, show how it uh, works, and make a simulation that I think can be interesting for uh, for uh, people that are listening this talk till now. All right. So what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to give a quick talk about 
um, a, a quick tutorial really um, on how to install and use the HQC package that we've developed in Python. So first of all, um, if you click on the link um, in Giuseppe's presentation slide, it will bring you to my GitHub page where the um, HQC classifier is sitting at the moment. So this is a, so this package is a SkyKit Learn compatible package. So um, this page pretty much just gives you an introduction of um, the HQC classifier. So um, what I'll quickly do now is I'll jump into how you how you would first install the package. So if um, if I, if you have any machine learning people here, the first thing you usually do when you want to install a new package is you go into your uh, command prompt. So let's open up your command prompt window. You go to your directory where you save your pip file, your Python uh, manage uh, Python files manager, your pip file. Yeah. So um, so I have my pip file saved in my Python um, folder in that my desktop. So once you go. Once you change directory to the pip where the pip file is sitting, so all you have to do is just pip install um, HQC, and then you, you press enter, and then uh, and then HQC will be the package itself will be installed in your computer. So I'm not I'm not going to do it right now because um, the package is is already installed in my computer. So that's the that's one way to install the package into your computer. So but if you're using Anaconda. Um, all you have to do is just open up Anaconda Prom, and then what? So pip is already installed in Anaconda, so you don't have to actually um, install pip or change the folder where it's pip is installed. So all you have to do is just um, pip install uh, HQC. Simple as that. Um, I'm pretty sure this is quite standard with every other package. So I'm just running this through for those people who are not really familiar with Python. So once you have um, HQC package installed, um, so uh, you could pretty much run um, the code. So what I'm gonna do now, is I'm gonna run the code in Anaconda. So I'm using Jupyter Notebook in Anaconda. So I'm gonna uh, run through. So uh, Leo, we have just a quick question. They're asking if it's Python 3 or Python 2. Python 3. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, so yeah, so I'm gonna show a quick tutorial on how to um, how to use the HQC package. So first of all, you have to obviously import all your libraries. Um, so at the top here, you have your import HQC, which is the HQC product. I'm also gonna import some of the other packages uh, that I'm gonna be using for this tutorial, namely pandas and SkyKitLearn model selection and metrics. So now for this tutorial, I'm going to use um, the um, banknote data set, which is pretty much a standard machine learning data set, which classifies um, between a real banknote and the forgery banknote. So it's pretty much standard. So for, well, first of all, well, first of all, I should have import the libraries. So once you've imported your libraries, I'm going to just um, read in my uh, data set. So once you're reading your data set, this data set contains four features and the uh, target feature, which is class, forgery, or real. So these four features consist of variance, skewness, ketosis, entropy. So these are pretty much the image features of the bank node. So if you're, if you're into um, image processing, these four features would make sense to you, right? So we have four features and one target variable. So I'm just gonna then, um, extract the features x and target variable y in their own separate uh, arrays. And I'm going to now uh, flip, uh, split my data set into training and test splits, 80-20% um, train test split, which is all pretty standard. So this checking here, we have about 1,100 rows for the um, training data and 275 rows for the test um, data set. Now, after this, we're going to uh, fit the model. So now, as Grisette has mentioned, there's four hyperparameters for this HQC. The first hyperparameter is what we call rescale. So we're pretty much rescaling the data set. So, so say, for example, if you, 
if one of your rows have got values of one, two, three, and you rescale with a uh, parameter two, it'll be two, four, six, because you multiply each entry by two. So uh, with this, uh, with uh, with the hyperparameter values, we, um, the default values that we have set for the four hyperparameters for rescale is one. You can actually change this if you like, of course. And then for the number of copies, we have it at the number of copy uh, default as one as well. Uh, so as Giuseppe has mentioned, the number of copies is where you um, take a tensor product of the entire data set and you keep increasing uh, the um, Kronecker tensor product. And then you have the encoding hyperparameter, which consists of two types of encoding. The um, You have your um, amplitude encoding, which is the default value here. And then you also you have the stereographic projection encoding method, uh, which is the other encoding method. And then after that, you have the class weight hyperparameter. So this class weight hyperparameter is the, um, the weights assigned in the Hellstrom observable. So the default one with, that we have is equiprobable. So that means we assign equally half weights to the two terms in the Hellstrom observable. The other one that we have is is the um, weighted um, hyper uh, weighted value for class weight, which is pretty much assigning the um, proportion of how many rows that you have in class one versus how many rows you have class in class two. So those are the four hyperparameters for the model. And this package has also been uh, parallelized. So if you're, if you're familiar with parallel computing, that what, that's what it means. So we have to, because it's parallelized, we've got these two additional parameters for the model. So n jobs is your usual SkyKitlin um, parameter for parallelization, which is pretty much equivalent to how many cores on your, on your device, on your computer that you want to use to do parallel computing. So by default, it's none or one. So in other words, it's just using one CPU on your computer. And then this other parallelizing, par parallelization parameter is what I call n splits. So it's pretty much splitting the data set into batches, all right? So by default, it's one. So that means there's no, no splits, no batches. There's just one whole batch, there's this one whole data set. So you can have two. If you have two, that means you split your, your data set into two batches, and you run these two batches in parallel. So that would, that would actually make the algorithm run faster. So, so now we're going to fit the model. So since we've imported HQC at the top, so you just, you just call the, um, the, the model HQC, HQC. So HQC is where you import at the top. And this second HQC is the class constructor. So, um, so I'm just gonna keep the four hyper the four hyperparameter default values. I'm gonna set um, my n jobs to four because my device or machine has got four CPU cores. And with this n split, uh, the recommendation value for this n split is uh, the number of cores you want to use divided by two. And the reason for that is because um, the algorithm itself has been um, parallelize for the two classes by default, they, therefore you divide by two because um, because if you're using, if you have two classes and you want to run two classes um, simultaneously, you've already used two cores. They, they, that's why you divide it by two. So I'm just gonna run this now. Yep, that's all done. So now let's have a look at the, um, ac um, the performance of the model. So for simplicity, I'm just going to use the accuracy score. You can use your F1 score or your ROC AUC score if you like. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to um, predict the pre predict the test set value, uh, uh, test set, the class with the text test set, and then I'm going to get the accuracy score. So I'm going to run that now. So as you can see, the first the first run here using the default hyperparameter values gives about 82% performance. Now, if you want to just run the accuracy score with just one, one line of code, you can actually just use um, uh, model.score uh, and your test set features and your target for your test set. Uh, this is pretty much SkyKitlin um, convention uh, because the package itself has been 
uh, written in SkyKitLearn. So you could use uh, SkyKitLearn methods to get the same thing. So pretty much the same score. Uh, so now I'm gonna um, now I'm I'm gonna focus on so now I'm gonna change some of the one of the hyperparameter. I'm gonna focus on this particular n copies, all right? Because um, this is a really unique and powerful um, hyperparameter where in general every time you increase n copies, the um, performance will increase uh, in general. So I'm gonna um, change instead of the, so the first run here I've got n copies as one because that's the um, that's the uh, default value. So now I'm going to increase that to two and see what happens. So everything else is the same, M jobs four, splits two, and all the other all the other three hyperparameters are the same. And let's have a look to see what the performance is. So as you can see, it jumped from 82% to about 95% for performance. Now I'm going to further in increase N copies to three, and let's see what happens with the performance. And Voila, it increased by another um, three, about 3%. Three so it goes up to about 97%. Now let's have a look to see what happens if we increase it to four now for n copies. So now this is gonna take uh, a few seconds because as Giuseppe has mentioned, every time you increase um, the number of copies, the, um, uh, the, the matrix uh, gets bigger and bigger. So because there's more calculation involved with a bigger matrix, it does take a little bit of time for it to run. So now it's finished running. You can see the performance increase a little bit as well, to, now to 97.4%. So now because the package has, uh, has been written in SkyKitLearn, you can use Grid Search CV to do hyper-tuning of the other parameters. So, um, so I'm going to show an example here using Grid Search CV. And, um, because it's going to take a while, I've actually ran this code earlier today, and I'm going to show you guys here on this second file that I have, with which I've already run the, run the bridge search CV. So with this bridge search CV, as usual, you define your parameter grid in this dictionary. So I have my rescale, my rescale parameter zero, as 0 0.5, 1, or 2. And copies, I'm going to keep it as, as 4 because uh, from here, we can see that that's the highest performance that we get. And then with the encoding, we're going to choose the two different enco encoding methods that we have, amplitude and stereographic projection. Class weight, we have equiprobable and weighted. So I've already run this, uh, this cell earlier today. So let's have a look to see what the accuracy score is uh, from this bridge search, search CV from all these hyperparameters. So, so now, now it goes up to 98%. So previously it was 97.4, now it's 98%. So let's have a look to see what the best hyperparameter combination is now. So as you can see, the best hyperparameter com combination is equiprobable for class weight, amplitude for encoding, number of copies is four because we only have four, and rescale parameter, parameter is 0 0.5. So uh, as you can see, the um, for this particular data set, every time you change n copies, um, the performance increases. So this is in general. So sometimes, depending on the data set that you have, it might it may or may not increase, but in general, it does. So this n parameter hyperparameter is really powerful in some sense. Um, uh, so so. Essentially, what I've discussed today is pretty much all in my in this uh, in my GitHub page. So there's actually a documentation here as well for this package. So if you open up this link to the documentation, uh, uh, whatever. We, know we have a quick question. They're asking if the is available for MATLAB. Oh no, I'm afraid no. At the moment, it's only Python. We've only oh. developed it in Python. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, so if you go to this documentation, you have all the details that you need for this, uh, to use how to use this package. So um, if you go to the user guide, um, this, sec this user, user guide section consists of three sections, how to install the, um, the package, with, uh, which I've shown you just now, pip, pip install HQC, and also how to use the API, which I've shown you just now as well. 
Um, and, um, and also, it has another section here to show you how the HQC algorithm actually works. So I've gone through, I've actually written out step-by-step -step guide on how the algorithm actually works. So if you want, you could actually have a look at the source code, which is back to my GitHub page. So this is where the source code is on my GitHub. So those of you who are interested, you could actually open up this, um, uh, this screen here on one side of your on the, of your computer, and then you have can have the source code on the on the on the screen next to it, and then you can actually go through step by step on how the algorithm actually works. Those for those who are interested uh, with this, um, uh, so I guess that's pretty much the end of the tutorial. I'll open up the floor to anyone who has any questions. Okay, so I guess the, no. Yeah, so what, what I'm saying is that we will follow the usual the usual path. So if you have questions, just write in the chat and I'll give you the option to make it by voice. Sure. So um I'm so if, uh, so say later on if you have any questions, you can just send me an email if you like. I'm happy to reply to every single email. And I'm. I'm also. I just want to also encourage every. You know, encourage you to try out this HQC package yourself because, as you can see, this n copies hyperparameter is quite powerful. Where, in general, every time you increase this n copies, the performance would increase. So that's something quite interesting about the HQC classifier. Yeah, and uh, since there are no questions, I'll make one. Uh, I wonder if this is actually uh, like convergent to one. So if n copies goes up, does the accuracy tend to one? Uh, we have done some simulations. Um, the problem with that is because uh, there is a computational cost with increasing n copies. So mm -hmm. it takes really long. Uh, it takes really long. Uh, to for the for the model to run when n copies is really large, so uh, at this stage I wouldn't really say that we've gotten to a stage where we have reached a perfect performance on the test set, but it is possible I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could be possible. Yes. The right now we're still developing the package itself, so we're still trying to make it run faster. So um, we'll see what happens. Okay, and uh, n copies is, is the only upper parameter which has this kind of effect. So rescaling might change on the like increasing side or decreasing side. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So with the n copies, is one direction. Every time you increase n copies, it will increase. But with the rescale, it can go either way. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. So I've actually um, I'll be putting up this tutorial on my GitHub page as well. So for anyone of you who's interested, just click on the GitHub link on Giuseppe's presentation slide, and you'll be able to see um, you'll be able to see um, the present the um, this tutorial on my my report my repo. So I'll probably just show you guys here. So I have it named as Ubino Summer School 2020. So okay. Yes, it's right there. Uh, you remember that uh, we began with this kind of with, with this uh, this question: Can quantum information theory help classical machine learning by using classical computer? Only we can say yes now, and we can uh, we can summarize the differences in this picture because we can say that uh, the run quantum machine learning. Well, this is a, a, a difference between quantum machine learning and quantum inspired machine learning. Or as I proposed, just quantum learning, as also uh, Leo suggested a few days ago. Well, runs the first run on classical computer, the second on uh, the sorry, the first on quantum, the second on classical. The language of the first is the language of the quantum algorithm. The uh, language of the second is the language of classical computation, basically. The benefits of the first is the quantum complexity. The benefit of the second is the accuracy of the process. But it's important that uh, the point is just to make a merging between both in order to have to 
to gain both benefits. The invariance is the quantum machine learning with invariance and the rescaling, of course. And the quantum learning, let's say, is non-invariant under rescaling and under tensor coping and preprocessing. Okay, what are the open problems? The open problems are many. The first is just, okay, we understand that there is an empirical way to establish every time what is the best encoding and so on. But anyway, we can try to make a kind of a priori investigation, maybe even by the type, the covariance matrix of even data, of each data set. The covariance matrix is a, a matrix that gives some information about the distribution of points in a data set. And maybe some investigation about this can give us a priori some information regarding what could be the best encoding, for instance. The other point that we will uh, focus on, we are focusing on now in our investigation, is uh, how to generalize this quantum inspired classifier that, uh, as we have seen, is only binary. Because, well, sorry if I didn't stress it, uh, our Elstrom classifier is based on positive and negative eigenvalues. So by its our structure, it is binary. It is can, it cannot be extended for any reclassification. It is an important thing, but uh, we can say that we have already important result on this basis in order to not extend, but just find a new one to inspire the most multi-class classifier. Uh, other thing, we exploited only some property of quantum formalism, the mixed state, for instance, or the tensor copy, but we didn't use, the, for instance, entanglement or other property of quantum formalism. And maybe there is a way to gain more benefit only regarding by other, other, other properties. And finally, provide a quantum quantum version of Delston quantum classifier. That means provide a quantum version of the quantum inspired. It is not a contradiction at all. It is just a way to say that it's possible to take this algorithm that we introduce and apply this in a quantum computer in order to merge together both benefits. And fortunately, we already have uh, the result, maybe we can say, well, we have to check it because, because this is just things of the uh, uh, obtained in the last 10 days for us relating to the blue points. So we hope that for the next uh, uh, school uh, in Urbino to maybe introduce some new result uh, when these blue points will be solved. Will be solved. We are in a good mood. Uh, another point is just to uh, move the investigation from the theoretical to the practical aspect. On this, we are, well, related to this, uh, as uh, already Leo said, um, using the parallelization, as, uh, as, uh, as Leo did, is very important. But if we can deal with a mega server, it will be possible to use a very, very large number of copies. And it will allow us to make an experiment over really big data. What we are actually doing is an experiment of not big but large data, data set regarding the clonogenic assay. We are collaborating with the molecular biomagic and physiology staff of the, and of the, unit of the CNR and uh, Centre National Research Centre with the University of Cambridge. Well, the the main topic, the main goal of this, uh, this, uh, this experiment is this. A clonogenic assay is a quantification technique of the survival degree of in vitro cell cultures, which is based on the ability of a single cell to grow, to grow in a certain colony, in a certain to call and to create a colony of cells. The purpose in the, bio, in the biological context is to count the number of the colonies. We have to deal with pictures like this. If you see here, you can see one, two, three, four colonies. Here we have one, two, well, and maybe three. In here we have one, two, maybe three, four, maybe five. Well, generally there are not so well developed, de developed way 
to counting this colony, and generally they use a kind of uh, by hand methods. Of course, by hands in terms of visual imaging, okay? Now, there is not an algorithm that is able to, in a very efficient way, to count this number of colonies. Well, a paper that was uh, recently published in a, in a, in a context of, in a context of bioimaging and physiology uh, shows that uh, a classification between pixel X belong to the colony and pixel X belong to the background is able to provide information about the number of colonies. That means that if we are, if we are able to uh, make uh, um, a segmentation of these pictures, that means extract from this picture the feature for each pixel. And if we are able for each pixel to classify if this picture belongs to the background, so the white, or to the colony, to the to the this part, if we are able to this to do this in a very very good way, we naturally have information about the number of the colony, the number of the colony. So make a, a background colony classification provides clonogenic information about the number of the colonies. Well, for us, it, it, it was a really nice occasion because for us, it is the way to attack the problem, to attack the problem on the binary classification in order to solve a really clonogenic problem, clonogenic problem. And so the data set we have to deal with is, uh, is based on four different cell lines, so four different data sets. Each one is given by 30 different pictures. Each, pi each picture is given by 90,600 9, pixels. So there are 301 times 301 square picture. In total, we have to deal uh, with more than 10 millions of data. So if we uh, remind how uh, my uh, second or third uh, uh, slide uh, when there was the classification of the data, it is a kind of large data set. Further, each pixel is featured not only by its position, it's not uh, only a matter of fortification, but for instance, also a color is an important feature of each, fi of, uh, each uh, uh, pixel, and also other, other uh, uh, features. So, the aim, the other feature, there was the homogeneity correlation, energy, contrast, RGB, this RGB ju just color red, green, blue, Louvre, and so on. I have no time to come into details, but uh, these features are related to some biological reasons, uh, uh, reasons, sorry. And so the aim was compare the performance of the from quantum classifier with respect to 18 well-performed classifiers in order to know if, to uh, know whether our classifier is well-performed also for real data set and also for uh, this kind of clonogenic context. Further, once we are sure that our algorithm is well-performed, we will use this uh, in order to see if some feature is more informative with respect to, an, to the others. So in order to have a real, real biomedical kind of information. And well, these are uh, uh, partial results that uh, are not, de not, uh, not definite results, but we are very, very close with uh, Leo. We are uh, working every day <laughs> on, on this. And, uh, and uh, we are, we are, uh, we have a very, very, very confident result because they're very promising. Because we see that among 18 data set, our uh, sorry, 18 classifier, our our classifier is is uh, uh, one of the best. Basically, is the best. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, six, seven times, seven times over all over uh, over 12. Let me say these different experiments. And so, is the half of the time is the best, and half of the time, the best are all the others 18 classifiers. So, 
it uh, is very very good for us because allow us to say that uh, well for this kind of of uh, data set is a really really well uh, well performant and so the well our our comments is that is the clear supremacy of the Elstrom classifier with respect to all the other classifiers and also we find that there is the, a feature a particular feature that we say match format that is more performant with respect to the other so we have a confirmation regarding our classifier and we have first time in our life a uh, inform a kind of biological of uh, a kind of bioimaging information that select one feature that is more informative uh, to respect to the other a, a nice surprise that we also have uh, is also that we can obtain this this uh, also by making a very strong sampling from the initial data set so we can see that only we verify that by making only the 0.2 percent of sampling of from the initial data set it is enough to have a very good training for our Elstrom quantum classifier it is very important because having a, a small data set a small sample allows us to increase the number of the copies by by using our small server because we are using a small server but it is it was possible to obtain the result of the potential okay so the conclusion is that actually uh, this uh, experiment makes us very very tired but uh, uh, basically we are happy about this uh, and uh, this is the very quick uh, uh, um, very small uh, bibliography related references related to uh, the recent work and uh, and uh, that's it sorry for longer in time in my presentation that's it thank you